A reading from 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Hello, everyone. This is the ninth and final part in a nine-part series on the fruit of the Spirit, and today we're looking at self-control. And when I started thinking about self-control, I had to think of athletes. In June of this year, preparing for the Olympics, Olympian Simone Biles gave an interview about her training schedule. Six days a week, her day started at 7 a.m. with a three and a half hour training session. Then she'd get a break for lunch and maybe a short nap. After that, it was back to the gym four afternoons a week for another three hour long session. That sounds really intense, but it's actually not uncommon for Olympic athletes to train that much when they're preparing for a big event. Preparing for the 2016 Olympics, boxer Josh Kelly said he trained five days a week, three times a day, first thing in the morning, at noon, and then later in the afternoon again. He also had to follow a strict diet, sticking to lean meats and fish, veg, whole grains, and leaving aside the cheesecake that he loves. Athletes exercise self-control in all things says our scripture reading today, and it's as true today as it was when Paul first wrote that letter to the Corinthian church in about 55 AD. The life of an athlete is a life of self-control and discipline, disciplined eating, disciplined sleeping, and disciplined training. It's not, though, just discipline for the sake of discipline. They do it because they want to excel at their chosen sport. That's what makes it all worthwhile. And that's what makes that life of discipline actually really exhilarating. Thinking about her experience of training in the Olympic Village in 2016, Biles said, we're all in one spot trying to get a gold medal and everybody's so dedicated, motivated, just on top of their game. It's truly amazing. They love their sport and it's because they love their sport that athletes exercise self-control. So Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, invites his readers, invites us, to think about this question. What is it that we love? And what might we be willing to give up or to do in order to pursue it? With self-control as our theme today, we come to the end of our sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit. And as we've gone through them one by one, one of the recurring themes has been that you can't actually have just one. They all belong together. And today I want to focus in particular on how self-control goes hand in hand with love, the first of the fruits. In our reading today, Paul compares the Christian to an athlete. Just as an athlete exercises self-control and leads a disciplined life, so should the Christian. But the wider context of that comparison shows us that this is not self-control for its own sake. In this chapter, Paul is reflecting on how he has exercised self-control in order to better serve others. He's been disciplined and worked hard so that he won't be a financial burden to the new churches that he's planted. He was free to ask for funds, but he deliberately refrained from doing so, so that nothing would stand in the way of people hearing the good news of Jesus from him. He was self-controlled because he loved them. And now he urges them, these new believers in Corinth, to follow his example. They too are meant to show discipline and self-restraint for the sake of others, because they love them. Now for the Corinthians in their context, the specific issue at hand was food. The Corinthian church was divided over whether it was appropriate to eat food that had been involved in a pagan sacrifice, and a lot of the food sold in ancient Corinth would have been. Paul in his letter wanted to convince the Corinthians that they are, at least in theory, free to eat whatever they want. But if they're serious about loving one another, then it might mean not using that freedom. Because 
If by eating that meat they jeopardized their witness to their neighbors, or tempted a believer to join in worshiping other gods, then it was better not to eat. The way of love is to set limits on our own freedom for the good of others. Now today is Climate Sunday, and it's a day when we have to confront the fact that we, as a society, have not exercised self-control. We've not set appropriate limits on our own consumption. We've been reluctant to give up our freedoms for the good of our brothers and sisters around the world, for the good of future generations, and for the good of the rest of creation. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. So in light of the climate emergency that the world now faces, what might it look like for you and for me to exercise restraint for the sake of love? Do I have enough self-control when I go to the supermarket to walk straight past those avocados that have been flown halfway around the world and choose something that was grown locally instead? Some of you might not find that particularly hard, but I really love avocados, and for me, that's hard. Do I have enough self-control to resist the fast fashion sale rack? I can't claim that I always do, but when I do, it is because of love. It's because there's something I love more than jeans and avocados. So what is it that you love? And what might you be willing to do or to give up in order to pursue it? Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, an imperishable one, writes Paul. That victor's wreath that the athletes of the ancient world competed for didn't last. Olympic gold lasts a bit longer, but Let's be honest, ultimately, you can't take it with you. But there is a prize that lasts. A prize that lasts for eternity. A prize that can't be destroyed or taken away. Paul had his eye on that prize. That prize is knowing Jesus Christ. It's sharing in his resurrection life. It's helping others to know him and to share in that life too. For that prize, Paul was willing to endure almost anything. He was able to be self-controlled because he loved. He loved God and he loved others. And so if we want to follow his example, if we want to grow in our ability to exercise self-control, then we need to learn to love. Learn to love the right things and not waste our love on things that don't really matter at all. Learn to love the things that do matter more deeply, more consistently. As I love God more, love others more, love creation more, then self-control, giving up my freedom, saying no to the things that I want, it starts to get easier. So how do we learn that kind of love? Well. Partly, it's just like anything else, it takes practice. And in each other, in the church, God has given us a community to practice with. A team of spiritual athletes, a kind of Olympic village, if you like, where we can all encourage one another to keep our eye on the prize and not give up, even when it's hard. And partly, there's a mystery about it because ultimately it is the Holy Spirit who grows that fruit in us, who fills us with his love and his self-control. So that self-control isn't just about rigid rule keeping for the sake of it, but about lovingly surrendering our freedom for a greater good. That growing in that love and in that self-control is not a process we can control. It's something God does in us as we surrender to him. As we're filled with the Spirit, He helps us to love the things that are truly worthy of our love, with God Himself at the top of that list. It's like that old hymn says, Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up thine eyes and seek His face. 
life with its way before us lies. Christ is the path, and Christ the prize. Amen. prayer of St. Augustine of Hippo. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. <laughs>